Africans. Islam is the only religion that liberates the people from oppression and subjugation. And the Prophet ﷺ gave the most beautiful example to this. A thousand million people today who believe in it. I will only be speaking about scientific facts which have been established. Quran says that if anyone chooses religion other than the religion of Islam, he is lost. Simra Ansari is the fastest growing religion on earth. Alhamdulillah. Farik na Islam comes from the root word Salam, which means peace. history and he analyzes Louis Pasteur the man who discovered the microbes and he analyzes Mahatma Gandhi Hitler Mussolini and Jesus and Moses and Muhammad peace be upon him and he comes to a conclusion that perhaps the greatest leader of all time was Muhammad this view is paid off by the American government a professor in the Chicago University and a psychoanalyst he says perhaps the greatest leader of all time was Muhammad. And to a lesser degree, whatever Muhammad did, Moses did the same. His own hero number two, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, number one. I'm asking account for this. Why would this Jew go out of his way to do such thing? By going back in history, the Martin, a French historian, in 1854, he wrote a book, History of Turks, in French. The Turks being Muslims, Incidentally, they are Muslims, not very good Muslims at the moment, but very good Muslims at the forefront battle of Islam. We looked up to them for decades. He wrote about a Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He gives three standards. Jul Mazman gives three standards. Now this man, the Martin, gives other three standards. He says, if greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the three main criteria of human greatness, then who could dare to compare any great man in history with Muhammad? He is daring his people, bring your candidates, anybody to compare with this man, Muhammad. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107. We sent thee, not but as a mercy for all creatures, to the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, for the whole of humanity, for everything in nature. He is Rahmatul Alameen. Greatness of purpose, smallest of means, with what he starts. Before he's born, his father dies. He's an orphan. By the time he's six, his mother dies. Doubly orphan. By the time he's six, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, looks after him. And very soon he dies. Then who is looking after? His uncle, Abu Talib. No education, nothing. No political power backing up. No royalty backing up, nothing. This is the capital with which he starts. Smallest of means and outstanding results. A thousand million people today who believe in him and are ready to live by his words. If these are the three main criteria of human greatness, he says, then who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad? Bring your candidates. And he ends up with a beautiful tribute in his book by saying, Philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, the restorer of rational beliefs, of a cult without images, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and one spiritual empire, that is, Muhammad. With regards to all standards, all standards by human greatness are measured. He said, ask, is there any man greater than him? He is asking, is there any man greater than he? And the answer is reposing the question. In other words, no man greater than Muhammad. The greatest man ever lived is Muhammad. I'm asking, who bribed Lamati? Because this was in 1854, when the whole Muslim world was under subjugation. 
We were all under subjugation, except three or four normally independent countries, like Afghanistan and maybe Iran. Three or four normally independent nations. We were almost subjugated. Indonesia was under the Dutch. Malaysia was under the British. Mozambique was under the Portuguese. Egypt was under the British. Syria was under the French. We were almost subjugated. Our own motherland. Handful of people were occupying Pondicherry, the French. Another handful, Goa, the Portuguese. Every place where the Muslims were living, everybody were under subjugation. I'm asking, who bribed Lamartine? Why did he say all those things about Muhammad, peace be upon him? And some 14 years before him, Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest thinkers of past century, delivered a series of talks under the theme, Heroes and Hero Worship in Mankind. Heroes and Hero Worship. And his hero, he chooses our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his hero prophet. Not Moses, not David, not Solomon, not Jesus, but Muhammad, peace be upon him, as his hero prophet. And this was the time in the history of Europe when it was sacrilege for anybody to speak anything good about Muhammad, peace be upon him, because the people would hate that man and his religion. He pays the tribute to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and Islam. He says, the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Muhammad, peace be upon him, it was like a bird from darkness into light. Arabia became alive first. It became alive by means of it. A poor shepherd people roaming unnoticed in the desert since the creation of the world. Nobody gave them a second look. Nobody. It was like a liability for anybody took them on. Alexander the Great passed them by. The Persians passed them by. The Romans passed them by. Nobody gave them a second look. It was like a liability for anybody who took them on. Nobody knew them, roaming unnoticed in those deserts since the creation of the world. See, the unnoticed became world notable. The small has grown to the world great within one century afterwards. Arabia is at Granada in this hand that's in Spain and Delhi on the other. A Hindu gentleman by the name Professor Rama Krishna Rao. Rama is the god of Hindu. They believe that Rama is god. Krishna, another god. Rama Krishna, that's his name. Rama Krishna Rao. He is a professor at the Mysore University. He wrote a book, Muhammad the Prophet of Islam. Beautiful book, small booklet, full of references, knowledge and tribute to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Among the tributes to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he uses Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler wrote a book, Mein Kampf in German, that is, My Struggle. He has given some great thoughts. He was great. He was great from the point of view of leadership. At his behest, 90 million Germans were prepared to march destiny or destruction. He had to command, and that's all, destiny or destruction. And he marched them on to destruction. That Hitler in his main camp says, a great theorist is seldom a great leader. An agitator is far more likely to possess these qualities. He is always a better leader. For leadership means the ability to move masses of men. That's leadership. You can move people, destiny or destruction. Whatever the leader says, you have opted to march with him. That's leadership. You can move masses of men. The talent to produce ideas has nothing in common with the capacity for leadership. You might have the talent. Producing ideas has nothing in common with leadership. Hitler continues. A union of theorist, organizer and leader in one man is the rarest phenomenon on this earth. Therein consists greatness. These three qualities in one man who can organize and he can lead is the rarest phenomenon on this earth. Professor Ra concludes in his own words. In the person of the Prophet of Islam, the world has seen this rarest phenomenon on this earth, walking in flesh and blood. This is from the book, Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam. Coming from the lips of a Hindu, from a pen of a Hindu, it carries more weight. Another Hindu scholar, Diwan Chand Sharma, writes in his book, The Prophets of the East, on page 132, Muhammad was a soul of kindness, and his influence was felt and never forgotten by those around him. Let me give you a few more names of admirers of Muhammad, peace be upon him. John William Draper, in his book, 
A history of intellectual development of Europe. Say, four years after the death of Justinian, AD 569, was born at Mecca in Arabia. The man who of all men exercised the greatest influence upon the human race, Muhammad. George Bernard Shaw, in his book, The Genuine Islam, says, I've studied him, the wonderful man, and in my opinion, far from being an antichrist, he must be called the savior of humanity. Even in the 11th edition of Encyclopedia Britannica, it says, Muhammad was the most successful of all religious personalities. I would like to conclude my talk by saying, all these references that I have given to you about the greatest of Muhammad, peace be upon him, are from the lips of the non-Muslims. Allah says in the glorious Quran, وَإِنَّكَ الْعَلَىٰ خُلُقُنَ عَزِيمٌ So most certainly, thou, O Muhammad, you stand on the highest principles of behavior. One of our poets puts nicely again, he says, نَبِي تو ایسا ملا نَبِي تو ایسا ملا کہ زمانے ملا جواب ملا ستارے سب کو ملے ہم کو آفتاب ملا وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام علیکم ورحمة الله وبرکاتہ جزاک اللہ برده اسامہ for the motivating speech may Allah use your potentials for Islam to preach And many gold medals in sports and other extracurricular activities. Reading, writing and swimming are some of her hobbies. Her ambition is to become a Hafiza and a Daiya. She has been selected for a two months intensive course of Hifz of the Quran to be conducted by IIS in May and June 2009, in which the students are made to memorize the entire Quran. This course was first introduced in Mecca and is conducted once a year in Masjid al Haram. Some call it the agent of the devil. Some call it the root of all evil. Some even buried her alive. Only Islam gave her the rights to thrive. Sister Aisha Zaru will present a talk on women in Islam, liberated or subjugated. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والقاشئين والقاشئات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والسائمين والسائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجر أزيما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وعلى الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. So when we are talking about today's subject, women in Islam, liberated or subjugated, we have to understand one very important point. And the very important point that we have to understand is the very essence of Islam the very foundation of this religion. The word Islam itself means submission. Therefore, all Muslims are in a state of subjugation. In fact, every human being who lives in this planet submits into someone or to something. If we think about our ideas of right and wrong, good and evil, what we should do, what we should not do, what is appropriate behavior? What is inappropriate behavior? From where do human beings get these ideas? The first source of information from where we get the ideas of right 
and wrong, good and evil, what we should do, what we should not do, is from our parents. The second is our scriptures or religions. The third are our friends. How many people in this world do things because their friends want them to do it? Just because their friends are telling them, come on, let's do it, they do it. You are giving into what your friends want you to do. You are giving into what your scriptures, what your religions want you to do. You are giving into what your parents want you to do. Another very powerful source of information, especially in the world today, is the media. So many people are imitating what they see on the TV and what they hear on the radio. So these are just some of the sources of influence. Other thing that influences us and is not from the outside is the nafs. Your passions, your desires, I want this, I want that. That feeling that you want something from your inner self. What I want to do, then you give in to it. You submit to it. You are subjugated by it. If you understand this, my brothers and sisters, we also have to understand every human being is a slave. Every human being is given to someone or to something. And nobody can escape it. The West is saying we are a free society. It's a lie. Nobody is free. Everybody is giving to someone or to something, even if it is just to their own desires. But a Muslim is someone who gives into Allah. We don't even give into our parents unless they tell us to do something good. But if they tell us to disobey Allah, do we obey them? If our government tells us to disobey Allah, do we obey them? If the media tells us to disobey Allah, do we obey them? No. A Muslim is someone who gives into Allah. So we all Muslims are subjugated, not to the things of this world and the people of this world. We are subjugated to Allah. Now that we have given the introduction, we have understood the foundation which we Muslims view the world and view society. Let us now take a step back. Let us ask ourselves, why are we even talking on the issue in the first place? Why? Why even bother having to talk on the topic or on the issue of women in Islam, liberated or subjugated? And this is what we want to explore first of all. The reason is because in the world that which we live today, there is an idea, a concept that has been developing of human rights, that the human beings have certain inviolable rights that is due to their very basic nature as human beings. What do you mean when someone has rights? Because the opposite of someone having rights is that that person is oppressed. So this is what we are talking about, oppression. The opposite of oppression is being given your rights. And now we want to define oppression. What is oppression? What is the subjugation, this oppression? Let us not define it because in order to understand our topic, in order to comprehend it fully, we need to define the terms of what we are talking about. Now the concept of rights is very intimately linked with the idea of the nature of a thing, its nature. Let us take an example. Imagine you had an animal that lives in the night. They are night animals. They live in the night. Their eyes are big and so they can see and they hunt in the night. Imagine you took that animal and you put it in a cage and you kept the lights on it the whole time. You kept it in daylight. And even when night came, you turn the lights on. You will all understand that this is a very oppressive thing to do to that animal because you are keeping it away from its basic nature. Let's take another example, a human example. Let's take the example of a human being who is working very, very hard 
Maybe it's manual labor. Maybe it's on a computer. It doesn't matter. But this very human being is working very, very hard. And they do this work in order to get what? In order to get their wages. In order to get paid. And we all recognize that it is oppression. That if a human being is working very, very hard and we keep away from them the money that is due to them. When we have done that, we have oppressed that thing. We don't pay them their wages or the wages that we pay them is less than what they need to feed themselves and their family. So this is what we mean by oppression. Oppression means when you keep something away from what is basic to it. This is a very, very important concept in order for us to understand before we go any further. And one more thing that I want to introduce. The opposite, of course, of oppression is liberation. And I want to take the example of India. As we all know that India was under the yoke of British colonial rule for 300 to 350 years. And the people of India, the Muslim, the Hindu, the Sikh, the atheist, all of them forgot about for a time their differences in their religions, their creed, and their caste. And they all united in one common purpose. And that common purpose was to get rid of the colonial rule. Because it is the right of the people and the right of the nation that they should have access to their own natural resources. The natural resources of India are not for the British. The primary receivers of that should be the people who live on that land. This is understood. So liberation occurs when we remove that obstacle in order for us to fulfill our rights. Liberation for that little animal when it is given its natural environment. For the worker when he or she is paid their wages. So liberation occurs when their rights are restored. Let us go back to the issue of women. What do we mean by oppression of women? In order to understand whether a woman is oppressed or not, we have to examine and we have to understand whether in any environment, in Islam, the West, East, they are oppressed or not. Because unless we define the nature of the woman, and unless we understand the nature of the woman, we can never make a judgment as to whether any ideology or any religion oppresses her or liberates her. The second thing that we want to deal is with the nature of the woman as a human being. Historically and even today, there are some cultures and there are some societies which believe that men and women are the same. In fact, as recently as 150 years, that's only 150 years, a council of Christian bishops and clergy gather together to discuss, does a woman have a soul or not? And if she does have a soul, is it like that of a dog or like that of a slave? These are Christians debating on the issue. <laughs> Shale Rah, Sa 